Hi everyone, and uh, and welcome. Great to great to have you all here, um, and and online as well. I know there's a fair, fair few people online as well. Um, so uh, I hope you can hear us online as well. If I can get a quick yes, no. I can. Good, excellent. Thank you. Um, so before we get started with the talk today, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we meet, the Turbo and Yagara people, uh, acknowledge their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits, and uh, acknowledge also that these unceded lands, uh, are, that, that, that these are unceded lands, these are their unceded lands, um, and have always been places of teaching, research and learning. Um, uh, and we all acknowledge, obviously, also the important role that Indigenous people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people still play in, in the QUT community. Um, it's really a great pleasure for me today to introduce Fabio Giulietto, a visitor from the University of Urbino in Italy. I know quite a few of you have met Fabio over the last few days already and have, uh, have spent a bit of time uh, with him uh, talking about your own projects, talking about the projects that are going on within the DMRC and beyond, and uh, hearing you know a, a great deal about the, the many exciting things that Fabio's doing as well. Um, for me, Fabio's always been one of the, the, the most exciting researchers in the social media field. There's always something new I hear from him and learn from him whenever I, I speak to him. Um, and if you haven't been, I can also very much recommend getting yourself invited to Albino, which is a fantastic, beautiful place and uh, just a wonderful community as well. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I can't speak highly enough of Fabio uh, and, and what he and his team are doing. And so it's, it's fantastic to have him here and have him here for a week and, and really um, go deep on some of the things that, that we're all doing. Um, and I'm particularly excited actually about the talk today because it's one of those areas that is just rapidly developing and emerging right now, the use of AI tools in, in research, not just research on AI, but research with AI as well. So I'm really excited to hear what you've got to say about that and what, what you're currently doing on that. So really without any further ado, uh, over to Fabio and just quickly to say the meeting's being recorded. And if you've got questions online, perhaps ask them via chat, because I'm not quite sure we can make you heard in the room, so uh, we'll read out your questions at the end of the talk if you have any. But yeah, over to you, Fabio. Thank you. Thank you, Axel, for this. Uh, first of all, for inviting me and uh, for this super nice introduction. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, something we have started doing very recently, uh, and uh, uh, I decided to share this uh, with you because uh, I, really, I really would like to sparkle some kind of discussion around this. And this work um, has been um, uh, carried out in the context of uh, a EU project, which is called the Vera AI, uh, which, as you can see, has a number of uh, partners, both coming from the academia, from journalists, uh, from uh, the private sector as well. And the goal of this project uh, was, is to uh, develop a novel uh, artificial intelligence and network science based methods that assist verification professionals throughout the complete content verification workflow. Um, it is basically a continuation of uh, uh, one project that you funded uh, in the previous framework. And it just started because it started in September 2022. The main uh, part I'm working uh, on is uh, the analysis of these information agents uh, and un uncovering this information campaign. Uh, of course, because of my background on coordinated behavior detection, uh, which is, I guess, the reason why they invited me to, to the consortium. Um, in the context of this, we started looking into uh, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, generative models. And uh, the, uh, uh, this morning, when I, when I woke up, I uh, okay, can you speak to the mic? Oh, sorry. 
um, this morning when I woke up, uh, I saw this um, um, funny cartoon, uh, and I, I thought to start with this because uh, I would like to make clear my um, uh, point uh, of uh, view in the relationship about the hype uh, on this technology. And uh, I, would, I would like to do that uh, by telling my own direct experience with these uh, tools. Um, um, if you, for those who, who don't know me, uh, I, I'm really, I really like to try new things. Um, so uh, when I tried ChatGPT for the first time, it was like the fan uh, uh, chat bot, at least I tried in my life. And every time I was so disappointed after a few uh, 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 back and forth with the, with the system. And in this case, so I tried the, the, the useful, the, 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 the classic approach. I, I usually try to uh, ask uh, if, if you believe you are intelligent, these kind of things uh, coming from uh, the, uh, some background on the history of artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, I get back, and, and I was really surprised by by some by some responses because they were way more um, uh, uh, thoughtful than I expected. And then I started uh, investigating a little bit more, um, and um, at a certain point, I realized uh, that at least from from my point of view, there was something that that was worth investigating more, not only under the perspective of the user. Uh, but also under the perspective of the developers. Uh, so looking at the uh, developing side of the, of the open AI, um, I, some of the things uh, I, um, I use it and I will talk about today were actually launched the day I started using it, the day it was launched. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, will, I will talk about it. So, um, I know there is a lot of hype and we, are, we, we, we train, we become so accustomed of this kind of uh, continuous uh, hype uh, that goes in waves uh, for, from one next thing to the other next thing. We, are, we, are, we, we went through the web 3.0, we went through the metaverse uh, and all of this uh, end up creating this uh, uh, strongly skeptic uh, uh, view. My perception is that we are in front of something completely different than what the, the kind of technology we uh, I, I just uh, discussed. So it's not just uh, because we have to try new things, uh, um, but uh, because I really believe there is something there. <clears throat> and um, I will talk about the study, uh, which is uh, ongoing. Um, uh, which is um, um, which relates to Italian election, as you will see in a moment. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I will focus my um, uh, my talk on the methodological uh, aspect of it. Um, I will touch upon some results uh, because uh, it's needed to be uh, um, uh, aired because. Uh, it will help to understand and to go back and to reflect on the on the um, on the um, methodological workflow overall. Um, so the goal of the study was relatively simple. Um, we said, okay, we are going to experiment something new, and we would like to do in a, a, on a small, relatively small scale. Uh, addressing, uh, uh, nevertheless, something that we believe it is both important and incredibly uh, without answer yet. If you think about uh, the main issue in the field of disinformation, there is this great piece by uh, UI Bankler, which uh, um, he wrote in 2019. And in this piece, he say something like, uh, we have a lot of evidence of people trying to uh, influence the public opinion through information operation. But what we miss is the, 
the proof that this information operation had some kind of impact. Why it is so difficult to measure the impact? In my view, in order to measure the impact in, in a perfect uh, world, you will need first information about the exposure, who was exposed to the disinformation or problematic information. And on the second uh, hand, you will need the opinion of these people before and after the exposure. And we know that this is so uh, easy to say and so complicated to put in practice. But one of the uh, uh, first part of this, so measuring the exposure, shouldn't be so difficult. Why it is so difficult? It is so difficult because basically we, la we mo mostly lack the data uh, which only social media platform has. If you think about all the uh, data set, uh, most of the data set you use it till now, they are all based on interactions. And usually we all, as a field, tend to uh, infer, to measure exposure uh, using engagement as a proxy. But we know that this is not exactly this, the, 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 the same thing. And we also know that uh, uh, this, this, this uh, um, uh, specific difference was also uh, part of the public debate recently when uh, someone said, uh, when we look at engagement, uh, and, and I'm referring to uh, uh, the journalist of New York Times, Kevin Roos, who uh, uh, basically uh, create this uh, Twitter uh, uh, account, which every day tweets the list of uh, 10 um, uh, posts with most engagement uh, on Facebook. And this list was often full of uh, right wing uh, extremists. So I started uh, with this. And of course, after some time, people started talking about it. And of course, he was a journalist of New York Times, which uh, uh, helped in uh, uh, having you heard. Um, uh, up to the point that uh, Meta, uh, them, someone from Meta them, uh, themselves uh, responded through, in, uh, through Twitter uh, by showing another chart saying, you know, engagement is not uh, um, uh, is different from rich. Okay. Um, who, who has been in, in crowd tango recently? Uh, if you go to the search part of crowd tango, at a certain point, a new pop up appeared, which says what? It says exactly engagement is not a proxy for rich. So they they are, they are they are so into this debate that they decided to put it clearly in the in the interface and there is a in, it's, it's it's a huge space occupied in the in the, in the graphical user interface of crowd tangle with this uh, thing anyway um, we decided to rely on uh, a, a data on data provided by um, uh, Meta. Uh, to answer these two relatively simple questions. Uh, of, all, of all the topics discussed before the two most recent Italian election, uh, which was the one who get the higher exposure, the higher number of views on Facebook? It's, it's a very relatively easy question. And it's incredible that we can't answer this question after years and years of uh, this platform being so important in our uh, social life. Uh, and uh, the other such question is slightly, makes things slightly more complicated by looking at the demographics of this exposure. But just that, demographic by age class. Um, and we use it, we combine this data set with uh, open AI um, um, models at three different levels and we discuss we, I will talk about it in a, in a moment. First of all, let's talk about the data set itself because uh, the data set itself is, is 
it's a quite strange uh, beast. Um, first of all, uh, it's a, it is a data set which includes URLs, so links that have been shared on Facebook. Uh, in the la latest version of the dataset, which is the 10.1, because they keep updating it uh, two times a year, more or less, it contains 68 million uh, URLs uh, shared on Facebook between 2017 and October 2022. For each URL, you get not only the classic um, um, measure limit of interaction uh, and, uh, um, of, and, and action by users, uh, but you also get the number of views, the number of clicks, which is a good complement of views, uh, share without clicks, which also is quite interesting because it's people, you know, sharing things without even clicking the, the link before and the, the, the well-known other uh, metrics. Uh, this for 46 uh, countries uh, all over the world. Now, um, uh, you, you have to imagine that this data set basically consists in two tables. The first table, what they call the attribute tables, includes all the information about the URLs, such as the title, the description of the URL, when it was published uh, and things like that. The other table, uh, uh, which they call the breakout uh, uh, table, uh, co uh, consists of uh, rows. Each row, in each row, you will get a breakdown of the different interaction by uh, bro broken down by the different uh, um, um, variables of the uh, data set. So this means that um, you get, in order to, uh, uh, to even to simply, simply calculate how many views one URL has, you don't have this information at hand, but you have to combine different rows. And uh, I'm, I'm telling this because there is a reason why. And the reason is, um, I will tell you in a moment. Second, very important difference. We are all used to uh, engagement-centered data set in social media, which means that uh, 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 if I tweet uh, something uh, a number of time, this will be counted uh, for the number of time I perform this action. In this case, when they conceived the data set, they used an, a different approach. They say, we will count one for each user, no matter how many times the action would have been performed. And the logic is that uh, what they wanted to do, what they had, had in mind is to have a way at a certain point to combine this data with survey data. And that's why they needed the uh, 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 individual action, which you don't actually have in that sense because it's already aggregated, but still potentially you get this, 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 this kind of information. Uh, and given the fact that this data set uh, is uh, um, uh, user-centered, uh, they had to come to come out with a way to preserve the user privacy. They had to do that because they were also scared. Uh, 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 don't, don't forget that uh, uh, Meta decided to do this uh, more or less before, after Cambridge Analytica. So uh, the, the relationship with the scholars, with researchers uh, was very, very um, bad. Uh, and unfortunately for a reason in that case, uh, because in the end, uh, one of, uh, it was a researcher who collected uh, uh, the data the, the and then was uh, um, shared. Uh, 
So they decided to use a couple of approaches to protect the user privacy. The first is to uh, allowing into the dataset only URLs that have been shared publicly at least 100 times. So 100 times public is quite a number. Uh, in other terms, you only have popular URLs in this data set. The other and more impactful uh, um, uh, choose was to implement a, a technique which is called differential privacy. So differential privacy is a mathematical technique uh, to uh, put out a data set with a, a mathematical guarantee that no one will be able to re-identify the single users from the data you put out. It's, it's a complicated thing. I, I, I'm, I'm not myself an expert, but the logic is that uh, uh, the more you want to look at the data for uh, uh, big aggregates, hmm? let's, let's say a country, or let's say uh, a, a domain, uh, the less will be the effect, the effect of the noise. The more you want to look into small things like one URL, the more will be the effect of the noise up to the point that the noise will be so high that you won't get no signal. And this is very important because uh, it makes possible certain kind of studies and basically impossible other kind of studies. For views, for example, the uh, each metric uh, to each metric is associated a different kind of noise, uh, which is uh, all random uh, Gaussian. Uh, Gaussian is, is a shape, uh, but uh, um, the um, um, the standard deviation of the of the uh, distribution uh, change. Uh, and it changed basically uh, following this uh, law. The either is the number you want to observe, the either will be the noise. So in the case for views, which are the metrics with the either number for, lot, for reasons you may uh, can imagine, uh, you, have, you also have the larger uh, uh, amount of noise. This also means that most of the time you have to think about uh, your data not as a point, but as an interval, as a confidence interval, which creates all sorts of problems uh, when we approach, for example, classic models and so on. One of the uh, contributors to this data set was Gary King, uh, who is um, uh, a quite famous statistician working, working at Harvard. Uh, and uh, himself, we, uh, together with one of his collaborators, put out a package which is called Privacy Unbiased, uh, which allow you to run, for example, linear models on this data. Um, but still, it's only linear models, only you can't use interactions and things like that. So it's very, very limited um, under this perspective. Uh, the data set we have collected is basically uh, title, blurb, uh, or description. It's called blurb for some reasons in, uh, in, the, uh, in the data set, uh, which basically is the, uh, if you are familiar with HTML, is the title uh, and the description uh, HTML tag that you can see in the, in the, in, in the HTML of uh, news web, web pages. Mm, or maybe all web pages. Um, we uh, collected this data, uh, these URLs, uh, specifically querying for those URLs that have been prevalently viewed by Italian uh, users. What does it mean? It means that given the fact that it is difficult to distinguish between uh, languages in the in the data set 
they decided to go into different direction. Instead of detecting, trying to detect the language and attach the label, they decided to pick the country uh, which was uh, uh, the, um, the country of the user which mostly viewed uh, the URL and to attach this as a variable to the, uh, to the URL. So you don't uh, exactly know if the, uh, it could be for some reasons that uh, a um, uh, link, a URL, a story in uh, uh, languages different than Italian may end up in, in this data set because it was for some reasons viewed prevalently by people in uh, uh, in uh, in Italy it's very very rare actually and uh, we we get rid of this of this but there were some uh, some cases um, and we decided to go for this three month frame frame before the date of the election for 2018 and for 2022. We, we decided to do that because uh, as you can see, the, the data set was updated in April 2023, 2023 um, uh, and the election uh, was in September. Uh, so uh, basically cover uh, enough uh, time to cover the Italian, the Italian election of 2022. Uh, so, uh, let's start with the first application of OpenAI models that we employed. Um, we just, I just said about the, the time frame, three months before the election, um, and uh, in the end we get this number of URLs, um, 65,000 and slightly less than 20,000 for 2022. Uh, then we extracted from this data set a random sample to be coded manually in order to uh, have a gold standard to be used to train uh, a model to recognize political versus non-political URLs. Uh, we have uh, created this 5,000, around 5,000 uh, uh, links. Um, we coded it with the standard practice, so by training the coders first, and then uh, um, uh, each of the coder coded part of the, of the data set. <clears throat> Before, uh, and, then, and then we train the model. What does it mean training the model in terms of uh, uh, open, the OpenAI logic? Because when, when you think about training a model and you are not a computer scientist, it sounds something incredibly complicated. In this case, it was incredibly easy. It all spoiled down to provide uh, uh, to the OpenAI uh, servers uh, a CSV with your gold standard. It asks you things, very basic things, which really help you in the process, like, okay, do you want to uh, divide this data set in a, a training set and in a validation set, something that uh, anyone who uh, know how to train a model will do. Uh, but this is really helping you uh, in, to, go in, to go into this uh, direction. Basically, you download uh, a, a command line um, um, package, uh, and then you, you, you interact with this uh, server by providing the, um, the, um, your, your, um, your, your data. Uh, the process is relatively quick and you can train different models. You can train from the biggest and more expensive model, models like DaVinci uh, to the smallest and less expensive uh, like ADA, which is the uh, less expensive. And in, uh, if you look at the um, uh, information on the uh, OpenAI website, they will tell you if you, if you are going to, if, if your goal is to build a binary classifier, then ADA will be probably more than enough for what you need. Uh, we tried with ADA, we tried with 
Curie, which is the uh, immediately uh, bigger model. Um, and in the end, we get slightly better results with Curie. Um, and we ended up with our uh, classifier of, of political um, uh, URLs. Uh, keep in mind um, that we deliberately decide to employ a, a relatively loosey uh, uh, concept of political because it's relatively it's, it's it's quite easy to say is it political only if it for example contains the name of a politician or the name of the political uh, political party but we wanted to do something different we know how important it is when uh, how important politically is sharing some urls that on uh, the surface doesn't seem to have nothing to do with politics um, migrants uh, um, uh, dying in the mediterranean sea technically is not politics uh, but we know that it is politics under many many perspectives and the same happens for many many things that are at the boundary we wanted to keep if possible these things in so when when we trained the model we tried to teach the model to to keep this thing um, and as you can see uh, uh, the uh, model itself has relatively good performances um, usually uh, these models are evaluated through this um, this um, uh, matrix. Um, before applying the model to, all, to the whole data set, we cleaned it up a little bit. Uh, I'm not talking about the kind of cleaning you may have in mind when you go through to topic modeling, which is sometimes very, very difficult uh, and uh, time consuming. I'm just saying that we removed uh, cases where uh, the title and the description was missing. In, this, in that case, of course, the model wouldn't be able to say nothing about our URL. Cases where the title or description wasn't in Italian, uh, relatively few cases that, that I, just, I discussed be, uh, before. Um, and cases where the combination of title and description were too sh so short that probably uh, won't, won't uh, be able to give the model an opportunity to create to give back meaningful results. So that's why we removed this. Um, uh, the, we cleaned up this data set and then we ended up with a, a, a relatively clean data set of political URLs. Uh, slightly less than 30,000 and 8,000 on the other end. So this is the first uh, um, building a political classifier, a, a, a binary classifier for political URLs. And I think it's relatively easy to replicate uh, on, on different cases. Second part, and, and of course, uh, uh, you will see in this workflow here and there the symbol of dollar, which means that we paid something for that. Uh, I wanted to briefly touch upon the 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 the, the, co the, 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 um, the question of uh, the, the the things about costs. Um, uh, training the model uh, cost depending on the model you want to train. Training Da Vinci will cost more than training Ada. Um, it's um, but it doesn't really cost. Too much it's i'm talking about the whole thing cost of me i don't know 150 dollars uh, uh including the fact that i was learning how to do this so sometimes i, I i've done two two times the same thing just to try out the differences second part um we use it uh, a um uh, endpoint of the api which is called embedding api what does the embedding API does uh, for those who, uh, uh, um, who are um, who, who lack a technical background? Basically, in, in a nutshell, uh, given a text, 
the embedding API will output uh, a, a vector of numbers. In the case of this API, I'm talking about 1,536 numbers, which basically uh, represent uh, the sentence in the context of this multidimensional space created by the model. Um, the good thing is that when you transform uh, text to numbers, uh, you end up with things that with, with something with data that it is very easy to analyze uh, from the point of view of uh, how distant is this text from this other text, this string of numbers from this other string of numbers. And there is plenty of measures to do that, the cosine distance uh, and so many others. Um, so we um, requested the embeddings for uh, all the 57,000 URLs of 2018 and uh, 18,000 of 2020. <clears throat> and given the fact that it is so relatively easy to measure the distance, uh, it's also relatively easy, easy to measure, uh, to create clusters uh, using one of the many uh, approaches. We uh, decided to go for the key means clustering because it's usually uh, the clustering technique used in these cases. Um, but uh, I have to say that uh, there are plenty of different uh, opinions in the in the in the world about about it. Um, and the other things where there are plenty of different opinions is uh, how do you uh, come out with the right number of clusters for your cluster uh, clustering strategies. Um, I think we tried out uh, four or five different uh, of the classic metrics from the silhouette score to the other scores. Uh, in the end, we decided to combine some of these um, uh, scores uh, to end up with this uh, number of clusters, 27 for 2018 and 24 for um, um, 2022. Then you get the clusters. Uh, and this is the third part where we use uh, uh, OpenAI uh, models. We wanted to try if it was possible for the model to output a label of the cluster without us being involved in looking into the data to uh, uh, find out what kind of URLs have been clustered together. Um, and we designed this uh, prompt, uh, which you can uh, also try yourself in uh, ChatGPT. Um, <clears throat> And basically, it's, it's, it's super straightforward. I mean, it, we just described uh, what we wanted. Uh, and it, the prompt says, you are the helpful assistant of a, of a political scientist. The first version where uh, you are a political scientist, then I decide, no, I don't want you to be the, the political scientist. I, I want you to be the assistant. Um, uh, studying the 2022 or 2018 uh, Italian election, on Facebook. Your goal is to provide a short label in English that describes the commonalities in a cluster of similar links circulated on Facebook. As often happens in this case, the more precise is the request, the better is the result. Uh, for example, if you uh, um, um, do not specify that the label has to be short, uh, you, will pro you will sometimes get long answer describing the, uh, the, the, the label, which sometimes is useful. Uh, but um, don't forget that when you use the API, you pay for the amount of text you provide plus the amount of text of the response. So the longer is the response, the longer you are paying. Uh, and there is, of course, way to say, no, you, you are not going to, to reply more than X number of tokens. And tokens is a magical word. We are going to, to, to come to it now. Um, um, and the first part, the first part basically set the uh, context. 
The second is the, is, the, is, the, is the request. I will provide a sample of links for each cluster. For each link on the sample, you get a text that, that concatenates the link title and the link description. What are the commonalities among these links? And then we passed, uh, we uh, am, include uh, a list of the links in the clusters. And then the prompt finished by saying English label. And now you may uh, wonder why you decided to include a sample of the, of the URLs. And the reason is that this model has limits of token. And you, you experimented yourself probably sometimes with ChatGPT itself. If you passed tons of, of text, it will say, no, 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 much. Um, depending on the models, this limit is different. For example, uh, last week, uh, uh, OpenAI um, launched a new model which allow for four times the text that it is possible, that it was possible to allow uh, at the time that we run this, uh, this work. Um, but um, how do you sample the URLs that you provide to this system in order to get the most um, uh, precise label. There are many options. Uh, the one we decided to go through was to uh, sort the URLs by their uh, um, closeness to the centroid of the cluster. So basically, we are providing those who are more, who should be more uh, um, uh, strictly related to the topic that put the cluster together. And okay, I, I won't go too much into the detail. I'm, I'm already going quite quite enough, uh, but I think it's it's, uh, it's useful to, uh, to to get the the, the whole process. Uh, so we uh, use uh, in our case this uh, GPT 3.5. Uh, it's not the 16K, which is the new one. Uh, actually, it's the 4K that uh, I will uh, the, the class the labels you will see have been created by the 4K. I also wanted to include uh, a slides uh, showing how the label, labels changed from one model to the other. Uh, what I can tell you is that they are very stable, um, uh, but they are also slightly uh, different, of course, because you are providing uh, a different, uh, different text. And we, we um, at a certain point, we ended up with this uh, um, 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 clusters, and uh, we decide we started to explore to uh, to, to 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 be uh, sure and uh, confident ourselves that the process was uh, at least valid at, at the face level, um, and, and and in the end, uh, since we were so surprised by the quality of the results, we decided to. Uh, uh, First of all, to create this kind of uh, interface, which allow us to uh, explore the clusters uh, um, uh, in an interactive way. And unfortunately, the, what you are reading there is the title and description in Italian, so it's not really mean, meaningful for you. Uh, but uh, you can see that you can select a cluster and then you can uh, explore the uh, individual URLs uh, clustered uh, together. Um, and then we um, also decided to make this uh, two visualization, interactive visualization available uh, for everyone. So if you want to try it, uh, you can uh, uh, take a picture of this QR, QR code and you will uh, end up on a GitHub uh, where you will get these two visualization. You will be able to explore yourself. Um, the um, uh, the clusters we have um, um, uh, and, and we wanted to do that because the first time we we presented this last week it was an Italian conference of political uh, communicators um, and so uh, uh, we, we we really wanted to show them uh, to, talk, to tell them go ahead and explore because we know 
and it is it makes sense to be skeptical uh, of, of all these new things, especially when they seem so uh, 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 working so well somehow. It's always good to be critical. Um, um, but yes, uh, this kind of thing seems to uh, work for us up to, to the point that we decided to make it public so everyone can uh, check uh, and see uh, if the clusters were meaningful, uh, if the label were meaningful, uh, if the, um, yeah, if all, at least on the, on the face validity level is fine. Uh, so this is the full um, uh, workflow, which end up with uh, going back to the URL shared dataset. So we started by getting the URLs from the dataset. And now we want to combine these URLs with the metrics uh, uh, about the interactions and the special, especially specifically about the views. So we uh, queried again the data, aggregated the, the data, uh, and uh, handled uh, in uh, uh, some way the um, uh, the noise. Uh, the, the noise issue wasn't such a big issue for us in this context because we are talking about aggregation of uh, a certain number of URLs. So the, uh, the fact that we are dealing with this aggregation makes the, the effect of noise less uh, relevant. And this is, uh, let's take a look quickly to the uh, results. This is the uh, top 10 uh, clusters for uh, each of the um, of the uh, election. And um, as you can see, and, and also the number of views um, um, accumulated by the URLs in these clusters, we haven't edited anything. So if we, you will see that sometimes there is uh, a final uh, point, sometimes uh, there is not. This is what it was provided back to us by the auto labeling uh, system. Um, what it is interesting here, let's, let's uh, uh, start looking at the results, uh, not under the methodological perspective, but uh, under uh, someone who is interested in the future of democracy in, our, in my country. So, um, uh, as you can see, um, something that it was uh, somehow uh, considered common knowledge that uh, uh, anti-immigration, anti-establishment, uh, and uh, all these uh, um, uh, culture war related uh, topics uh, were present at some uh, extent in Facebook conversation, but we didn't expect to see it so prominent. Uh, just say, just look at the uh, uh, anti-immigration clusters, which appears both in 2018 and in 2022 very prominently. But think about the differences between these two uh, uh, elections. 2018 uh, was strongly characterized uh, by one murder uh, committed by a Nigerian immigrant uh, of an Italian woman. And of course, uh, and it, it, one of the other classes is dedicated to this case. So it's, it, the immigration doesn't end up at, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the end of this 10 list, list of 10. Uh, uh, but 2002, there is no uh, uh, specific event related to immigration. And in the meantime, we had a global pandemic, we had an ongoing war, and these things, yes, of course, has some presence if you look at the, uh, at the labels there. Uh, but still the anti-establishment uh, 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 narrative, the overall anti-establishment narrative uh, is really, really prominent. Uh, the other interesting thing is that, as you can see, the anti-vaccination, uh, uh, as we know, uh, actually, uh, 
predates COVID because in 2018 we can already see uh, someone who, who were trying to undermine the uh, trust in, uh, in uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, uh, the debate around the education, education, Italian education system, which uh, in a way is connected to the cultural world, to the idea that you know the, uh, the left is monopolizing the culture in a country and uh, starting from from the from the education um, um, there is a lot of m5 star the other thing uh, the uh, uh, five star movement we know from our previous studies it's uh, the five star stars movement for those who, who doesn't know about italian politics is a populist uh, movement uh, which uh, basically um, become popular uh, uh, in around uh, 2015. They uh, took part to the first election uh, that year and it was a, a big success. Uh, and they were driven by uh, the, the use of the uh, alternative media, including and focusing specifically on the, on the and still they are having an impact also on uh, 2022 because the uh, citizen income, which is in Italian is called the reddito di, reddito di cittadinanza, it's, it's a law uh, created by the Five Star Movement when they were at the government uh, and now uh, uh, is being uh, removed by the new government. Uh, <clears throat> um, it was uh, one of the things uh, that were strongly uh, debated. Last thing. Uh, the um, the crisis, the idea of crisis, is very present in 2022 uh, for from, for the protest against the I, I, I energy bills, the energy crisis, uh, rising prices in Europe, um, uh, but also uh, the fact that the uh, financial aid and bonuses by the government uh, were also widely um, uh, discussed. Um, Let's take uh, a quick look of, uh, to the findings. Um, we, we decided not to show too many uh, charts and to uh, briefly describe what was more, most, most important for us to communicate in this context. Um, as you can see, uh, one of the first uh, striking things that uh, you can see is how the amount of political uh, conversation uh, decreased over the, this period of time on Facebook. And you can see uh, those of you who look at the, at the tables, maybe they have already noticed that there was a difference even in terms of URLs from 2018 to 2022. And this is this kind of decrease is clearly observable in the in the in the data set all over the world. Um, in our case, for the Italian election, uh, we are talking about uh, um, a drop from four billion views to one billion one billion views. At the same time, the audience demographic shifted dramatically toward older an older audience. Um, if in 2018, the uh, shape of the distribution is normal, in 2022, it's uh, all on the right size of older people. Up to the point that looking at the total number of views of political URLs shared in 2022, the uh, uh, older users, 55, uh, uh, years and older account for almost 50% of the total views. It's huge. Uh, then we, 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 we said, okay, maybe this thing is, of course, something which is related to the platform and not only to political links on the platform. And this is not completely true. Um, as you can see, when we uh, look at the data related to the non-political URLs in the data set, we, yes, we see a decrease uh, in the number of total number of views, uh, which declined by 50%, uh, 
but for political URLs, they declined by 70%. And the older uh, class age, 55 uh, plus, uh, made up 31% of the total views instead of 50%. So this means that uh, this process is not equal for political and non-political URL, where political URLs uh, declined more and toward an older audience. Um, and as, as we discussed, uh, the antagonistic rhetoric at different levels were, were very, very prominent. Uh, overall, the story about the immigration uh, were super prominent in 2018, but were still incredibly prominent in, in 2022. And one of the things we noticed is that not only the Five Star Movement is so uh, present, uh, but usually the clusters dealing with things related to the Five Star Movement tend to get an older audience. There is one case specifically, which is interesting. In 2018, we found a cluster which is clearly an information operation pro uh, Five Star Movement. Um, and uh, the um, um, uh, demographic distribution of the views around this uh, um, content uh, is really different from the other clusters, and uh, it tends to be way older, a way older audience. Uh, which, and I'm talking about clickbait titles on. Uh, video which are mostly excerpt from tv shows uh, cut in the right way to make it uh, uh, politician from the five star movement look good um, and you know that there is this uh, literature which speaks about the fact that uh, older people have been more exposed to uh, uh, false news uh, some some of these studies have been also uh, done with the URS uh, data set uh, and uh, also share more false news. Final slide, uh, a few points we can discuss, but I, there, it's, I really, it was very difficult to come out with only five points because there are, <laughs> the, 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 at least under my perspective, there were so many things to, uh, to say. So, uh, first of all, uh, to, to be, to be uh, clear, uh, we haven't yet validated properly uh, these approaches. Uh, we can say that on a face uh, level, they seem valid, uh, but uh, we have still to come out even from, with a, with a, uh, with a, a strategy to, to uh, assess the validity uh, of this. Um, uh, approaches. Uh, the meta data set, as in interesting it is, uh, it only includes links. And as we know, increasingly people get news within the platform with native content from the platform. So uh, the risk is that after such a big effort, uh, uh, resources put by meta, put by scholars to understand this, uh, this, this data set, uh, to get access to this data set, uh, because the process to, to get access is uh, quite complicated. Uh, we may end up with something which is not any more useful, either because, or because Facebook is not any more relevant, which is not uh, it, right now, uh, given the numbers they still, uh, they still have. Um, but of course, it's, it's, it's increasingly becoming less relevant if the trend continues like that. As I said uh, in the beginning, we deliberately decided to make this thing simple uh, because think about if we start to look at the clicks, if we start to look at the other interactions, uh, or if we intended to do uh, to look at more complex uh, uh, metrics, like for example the ratio, the ratio between sharing and comment, which is something we have used before uh, with some uh, interesting results, 
or the media partnership attention score that we discussed we discussed this morning with someone. Um, so uh, you can get for each clusters based on the fact that includes certain domains and, and uh, uh, with with a certain proportion uh, a score which measure uh, the how partisan and from which uh, partisan community the attention to the cluster uh, uh, comes. Um, uh, also using NewsGuard to uh, assess the credibility of the sources in the, um, in the, in the clusters. The point four is quite important and it is, um, it's something that really bugs me uh, uh, because um, the, uh, it's so difficult to measure the exposure. The best way we have measured it till now is to uh, uh, combine uh, surveys with traffic uh, uh, tracking systems, which, as you know, they only work on desktop computers. And just telling you this uh, should probably speak to the how how um, some results can really be um, um, applied to the whole population because as we know a relatively small percentage of users uh, browse through desktop computers not to talk about the fact that the panel and you know how difficult it is to get a panel uh, to, to to install something on your on, on your computer uh, but even just the fact that it is only desktop. So in theory, data from the platform is the only way to know, to know something about the exposure or things, very important things about the platform. But still, now we, we observe this decline in, in uh, uh, URLs overall and in political URLs uh, specifically. But the point is, are Italians less interested in politics or the way Facebook works prevented the political URLs to circulate? And how you disentangle this without knowing when the algorithm was in updated? You can't, basically. You, we don't know if this, this decline, the decline we observed, is on the user side or, or is on the platform side. And I'm telling you this because um, I was extremely surprised uh, when we uh, run a simple analysis on the URL share dataset with the goal of uh, identifying events that may have impact the interaction around these URLs on the platform. And we expected that local events would have some impact, an election somewhere, uh, a, a, a big crisis somewhere else. And the charts are, were and are all the same. They follow the exact same pattern. And there is only one explanation for this. The explanation is that the algorithm is shaping what it is going on on the platform at the global level more than any local activities can do. So what, was, what we are looking at is the way Facebook changed over time. And this is uh, increasingly complicated by the fact that we have this 100 public uh, uh, shares threshold because depending on the algorithm, there are moments in time where, where, when this threshold is easier to pass and moments in, in time where it is more difficult, both because we have less interaction, but also because the, the algorithm is pushing uh, or, uh, or, or maybe uh, uh, um, uh, confining something else. And uh, that's it. Um, I hope uh, I give you some uh, ideas to apply in your studies, but also questions to uh, to 
ask or to debate actually i don't have answer there <laughs> Much, Robbie. I'm just going to get the other mic in case anyone's got questions in the room. If you have questions online, please post them in Slack, uh, in, in chat, sorry, as well. Do we have any questions in the room? Just a technical one. Just, that's fine, just speak. Uh, all right. Um, just on the links in the, each post, we find that it, often it's not one link that's shared, one URL. You can have up to five URLs per post. So were the metrics associated with each URL? So say there were five, were they the same? Yeah, this is a great, great question. Uh, especially if you come from CrowdTangle where you have these cases where uh, a post may contain multiple URLs. But in these cases, we are talking about a data set of URLs. So they already have done for us the uh, work of extracting the URLs from posts and what you have is not anymore the post which can contain multiple urls but you only have the urls and all the interaction that has been gathered by the post i have to say that what how exactly they come how uh, um, extracting this post from uh, these links from the url is not entirely clear one big question for me is uh, if they only use a link type post uh, or uh, they also pick the URLs that user copy past in the text of, uh, of the message of the post, which is increasingly used. Um, I never get a, a, an answer to this question. <laughs> Uh, also a technical question. Thank you so much. Uh, your visualization of clusters looked looked really interesting. Uh, and I saw that you used TSNE as a strategy for visualizing the clusters. Have you experimented with other approaches like PCA or with TSNE, I think as well, there might be, I guess, different ways to visualize data. If you have anything to elaborate on that, it'd be great to hear. Yeah, no, absolutely. This is a, another great, great, great question. Uh, when you start from a space of 1,500 dim dimension, and you have to visualize it, then you basically you have two options, 3D or 2D. Uh, 3D was super complicated to navigate, uh, to tell you the truth. Uh, uh, 2D, you are losing even more uh, uh, precision in a way. So what, what we are actually saying in that charts do not really represent the clusters fully because uh, it's the, it is the results of the reduction from 1,500 to two dimensions. Um, uh, and uh, usually, um, the, as far as I know, uh, the uh, way to uh, go when you have to reduce this kind of dimension in such a way is you, to use this kind of algorithm. But I, I guess that other algorithms, we, we haven't tried other, other algorithms to tell you the truth. Hi, Fabio. I had a question regarding the, the quality of the, the document embeddings, considering it was short text, because Facebook posts are typically short and topic models are typically aren't great with short text. So what was your experience regarding the quality of the analysis? Yeah, as I said, it was, uh, we were pleasantly surprised by, by the results. Uh, and of course, we shared all your concern uh, I, I, I really ate, hated each time I tried to run a topic modeling uh, uh, because I was so dis disappointed with the results. Um, as soon as you look at the content, as you as you as you uh, always suggest uh, wisely to do, uh, you you realize that the way the things have been put together. Uh, it's understandable only to the algorithm, but not for a human being. Uh, so it's pretty, it becomes pretty useless in a way. Um, but also, if I can just jump in, it's not really the Facebook post that you coded, right? It's the it's the title, the title and description, and description of the URL. Did you ever? I mean, is there a way 
maybe also to retrieve the full text of the articles and then feed that into the coding as well? Well, in the, you have the URL. So from the URL, you can scrape the content based on the uh, availability of mm -hmm. it. But maybe with Factiva, you can do that. This, is a, this was a perfectly um, neutral question because we're, we're <laughs> yeah. just interested in that too. Uh, Dan. Yeah, um, so this is more of a speculative one. Yeah. So again, with the, the visualization of showing the embedding kind of space and, and the way you visualize it, some of the things we're playing around with at the moment in one of our kind of visual projects is kind of feeding data back the other way because the really cool thing about some of these generative approaches is not just how you can use it to kind of code data and then in, you know do the embedding and then kind of lay it out but rather how you can kind of reverse the flow and had you thought about like with particularly that ecosystem generating like prototypical kind of articles or things like that to kind of use it as a sense like a sense making exercise to see what does a typical article maybe look like in these areas of the cluster rather than trying to kind of have to make sense of thousands and thousands of articles to come up with a, a topic classification or just to see what kind of weirdness might exist I guess but in the liminal zones between those those clusters yeah super interesting suggestion uh, I, we haven't tried but uh, it's super it's something that yeah it really this kind of thing really opens an incredible uh, um, um, wide range of opportunities and as you say this is a, a good point uh, um, uh, overall um, there is always one more step that you can do uh, it's uh, similarly to what happens when one model train the other model uh in in this back and forth that you can uh um yeah improve and do something else after probably after this step there will be another step that you can do once once you have this new data which is the result of the yeah good good great idea so many applications of it including for example creating um false news or <laughs> automatically yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> False realistic news in Italian. I see a business there. <laughs> Which could also be used for, for surveys or experiments, of course, yeah, with, exactly. with people. Yeah. yeah this, is, this is really important because sometimes in, when they design experiments, they have issues in finding uh, compelling examples. You mentioned about the local events not impacting um, the patterns and I think yesterday when we were talking uh Sylvia and uh and me with you we were talking about fact checking and you mentioned out of the 68 million URLs there was a percentage that were yeah, top for less than 40,000 have been fact checked yeah this is another thing that is pretty depressive uh, when you look at the data set. and then of course they they will say that since the data set only includes very popular URLs, then there may be other URLs that have been fact checked but are not in the data set. You will never know. <laughs> I have another one if, if no one else has one. Um, the, and this is more on the, the actual content topical side of this, not so much the methodology. That massive drop, drop from one election to the other in terms of the use of Facebook and all of this. Um, I kind of have two questions about that. One is, to what extent is that simply news fatigue after COVID and into the Ukraine war as well, right? This is post the Ukraine invasion. So is that simply that people are switching off from the news, basically, because everything's horrible or has been horrible? And if, if it's not just that, if people are going elsewhere, where are they going? Do, we, do you know for Italy any, any kind of pointers for that? Yeah, my, my feeling is that especially for young people, um, Facebook uh, um, have become a toxic place. Uh, they don't want to go there, not only because they are, they are their parents and all you know, the things that we more or less know, but also because it's, they, they, yeah, they, they do not really want to hear anymore about this uh, superbolic, uh, um, titles and uh, super partisan things or people uh, fighting in the comments. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not a young people myself, so maybe uh, I'm uh, over interpreting some, some trends, but uh, 
uh, it seems to me that this decline is uh, um, depends on uh, how Facebook is perceived as a toxic space by young people. Um, and maybe, of course, this always happens when uh, something very a, a big crisis happens. Mm -hmm. The first days people follow the news, but immediately after you, they start thinking, yeah, okay, but I have so many problems now, but, and of course this is not good, but uh, I'm, I'm afraid that there is this kind of uh, um, practice. And other platforms? Uh, other platforms, young people, they uh, mainly uh, are on TikTok in Italy. Um, and yeah, I, um, this is not about Italians, but uh, uh, I, I um, recently had this podcast talking about young people. Uh, uh, because this uh, highly suggested podcast is called, it's called uh, The Hard Fork and uh, is co-hosted by Kevin Roos, the journalist I was talking about before, and uh, um, uh, someone from Platformer, which is uh, a, a technical blog. And they, they were talking about young, how young people uh, seems to be sick also now um, by the idea of being exploited by this platform, because they recognize the te these techniques in a very easy way, and they, yeah, they are, it seems to be fed up. Um, by the way, Jean asks us to stop sharing the slides so they can see the room and maybe yeah, we can, or give a wave to them, to the folks who are still online. Uh, this Jean as well, hello. Um, any other questions? And again, online, if you, Want to type any questions? One last one. There isn't. There isn't one online at this point. Any others? Tim? Yeah. I have a, a simple question. When you were playing around with the models, did you see any evidence of political bias in in the responses that that the models were giving? And were, in particular, were there ever anything that the the models didn't want to talk about, um, which to me, I think would possibly introduce some interesting methodological challenges because you don't know what it's not uh, going to uh, positively code your data with. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that we all experienced while using ChatGPT at a certain point this um, uh, bias by the model, uh, which we don't know if uh, it is uh, how, at what extent a bias is a positive thing at a certain point? I mean, uh, a model that uh, won't allow you to get uh, the instruction to build a bomb uh, is in a sort of way, a way biased because it was instructed to do so specifically, but it's, do we want it or not? So this is a big issue, about it, which goes back to the politics of algorithm. But uh, um, I have to say that, uh, one of the things I'm um, um, reflecting upon is um, all these uh, similarities between the topics, the labels spit out by the model. Could it be that are because of some kind of bias uh, um, in the sense that maybe he knows that during elections, people tend to talk about some things mm -hmm. And so it, um, so the only way to, to, to address this question would be to, um, uh, to validate properly the model, which is not uh, straightforward. Mm -hmm. One way of val validate it, which won't solve all the problems, would be to uh, give uh, a sample of users uh, a bunch of URLs and saying, okay, you have this option, uh, which are the, the labels of the clusters created by the system, where you would, would put this, uh, or including also no one of this. Um, but I don't know, I have to still, still to think, but it's, it's, it's very important because 
it could be that there may be uh, some bias. I have to say that also, if you look at the embeddings web page of uh, on OpenAI, they will specifically say that the embeddings are biased potentially. Uh, the version, the version uh, which is, uh, they, they are not of course specific about the kind of bias, but uh, they recognize they, 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 that specific model has biases. When I was looking at the one of the tables you had was really interesting and I wasn't sure if it was sort of the validated codings from the helpful uh, students <laughs> or, or if it was the automatic labelings, but some of them were really stood out, like some of them were conspiracy theories, some of them mentioned globalism. They were a bit and, judgy, right? In yeah, yeah. Sense. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and would, would, um, would a, a right-leaning um, uh, um, Italian mm -hmm. citizen with the eligibility to vote, would they construe that as anti-establishment or would they cage it as conspiracy theorizing to us it seems self-evident perhaps even right um, um but i yeah i kind of i just was wondering yeah this is a great yeah. point um, um, um thanks actually. yeah, yeah. And I, 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 this is the kind of question i really i i i don't have any real answer um and um we're talking about um um, a technology that uh, the inventor, inventor themselves recognize to be not accountable to them. So it will be very difficult to make it accountable by someone else. Um, Such a good point. Yeah. All right. I know quite a few of you will want to run down to drinks and theory, theory and drinks at the pub. Um, so uh, we might leave it there. Fabio, maybe if you want to step in front of the camera and just give everyone yeah. a wave online as well. Um, and if you will, would all like to give Fabio thanks for his wonderful presentation. <laughs>